Hello all. In this session on optimizing machine learning workloads on Dataflow by Alex Chen. Alex Chen is a senior machine learning engineering engineer at Trustpilot, and he'll talk talk you through it. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, so good afternoon. I'm excited to share with you today my experience uh, running and optimizing uh, machine learning workloads uh, with Beam on Dataflow. Uh, so just a little bit about Trustpilot. Uh, Trustpilot is a community-driven reviews platform uh, where users leave reviews for all kinds of businesses. Um, it's probably most well known for uh, the green star ratings uh, that you might have come across uh, when you've been shopping online. Um, it's very prevalent in the UK, so uh, if you ever come to London and take the underground, uh, you'll likely see uh, adverts on the tube uh, with businesses showing off their Trustpilot star ratings. Um, so how does Trustpilot use Apache Beam? Um, as you can imagine, as a reviews platform, uh, the main domain of our data is text uh, and natural language. Um, so we run NLP pipelines with Beam in both uh, streaming and batch uh, to power real-time analytics uh, across our website and B2B applications. Um, another large area uh, of focus is platform integrity. Uh, so this involves using uh, machine learning to ensure that Trustpilot continues to be a source of uh, trustworthiness. Uh, and we do that by detecting spam, uh, fake reviews and bad actors uh, and prevent preventing them from compromising our platform. Um, to service all of this, uh, we have built a a uh, feature store that is capable of serving uh, real-time data in both online and offline formats for uh, data scientists, analysts, and for model inference. Uh, and this feature store has Apache Beam uh, pipelines at center stage, uh, doing stream processing and feature engineering uh, from various event sources like uh, user and review activity. Um, so we use Dataflow as the runner for all of our Beam pipelines. Uh, so most of the use cases I will cover today uh, will be relevant uh, to those who are running uh, their Beam pipelines on GCP Dataflow. Um, so today I'd like to go over uh, four items with you. Uh, first, how we uh, use Dataflow Prime to achieve 40% uh, uh, cost savings on our large uh, batch ML jobs. Uh, second, I'll show a use case where uh, we can take advantage of uh, GPU sharing uh, on Dataflow uh, to provide data uh, for the next generation of uh, large language model powered uh, applications. Uh, next, I'll show you how you can get a huge speed up on any uh, linear algebra computations uh, that you perform in your pipeline. Uh, so things like PCA matrix multiplication uh, with very trivial uh, changes to your Beam code. And finally, I'll touch on uh, our migration uh, from custom implementations uh, of uh, inference, do funds, and p-transforms to using and adopting uh, Beam's uh, run inference transform and how this has improved uh, our code base. Um, so first of all, uh, Dataflow Prime. Uh, so this is a service on uh, GCP, uh, which allows pipeline developers to provide uh, resource specification at the pipeline step level. Um, this allows for much greater granularity um, of resource specification uh, compared to uh, using Dataflow without Prime. Um, so I'll illustrate this with a very typical uh, machine learning pipeline example. Uh, so on the right, uh, so on the left here, um, I have uh, a machine learning pipeline that does um, a lot of the very typical things that you might uh, be doing as well. So we're reading in uh, some data, we're doing some uh, CPU memory intensive uh, text processing, perhaps lemmatization, um, and preparing data for inference. Uh, in the next step, we're then actually running uh, that 
process data through our machine learning models. And then finally, we're writing all of this out to um, a store like BigQuery. Um, if I add a description for um, what kind of resources uh, each of these steps uh, requires, we can see that the resource requirements at each pipeline step um, is very imbalanced. Um, and normally on data flow, um, we are restricted to uh, considering the resource requirements uh, of the pipeline as a whole and to provision uh, resources that cover the maximal um, resource requests for each uh, resource type. Um, so that's uh, quite a costly restriction um, uh, when we're provisioning resources uh, to our uh, data flow workers. Um, and this is a restriction because um, when we execute a beam pipeline on data flow, um, this has to be executed with a uniform uh, pool of uh, workers. So for this pipeline in particular, we might end up having to uh, provision quite a hefty instance with a large amount of uh, memory and also a GPU. And this is despite the fact that uh, at any single step uh, in the pipeline, we are not really maxing out uh, utilization uh, of these uh, large resources. Um, however, with uh, Dataflow Prime, uh, what we can do is uh, set the resource uh, requirement, resource request at the pipeline step level. Um, and the uh, pipeline will then execute on Dataflow, uh, sorry, the pipeline steps will be executed uh, on Dataflow uh, separately. Um, so this is very simple to do in the code. Um, so ordinarily, we would define our pipeline uh, like this, um, where we just simply uh, chain together uh, transforms into a DAG. Uh, so to adapt this pipeline uh, ready uh, for use on uh, Dataflow Prime, uh, we just add these uh, resource hints. And inside these resource hints, we just need to specify either the amount of RAM uh, that we would uh, like the pipeline step to execute with, and also uh, whether we wish to use uh, GPU or not. So you can see on uh, this slide here, the resource hints I've given to each uh, pipeline step corresponds to uh, the amount of uh, resources uh, we think that the uh, pipeline step should execute with. Um, and then at the top, we just need to uh, add an additional uh, pipeline option to tell the Dataflow service uh, to use Dataflow Prime. Um, so to confirm and measure the degree of improvement uh, that we achieve, we, that we could achieve on costs, um, we ran a few small uh, benchmarks uh, with a batch pipeline very similar to um, what you just saw earlier. Um, so this uh, the pipe the, be the benchmark pipeline that we ran uh, was similarly uh, with a very highly imbalanced uh, resource uh, requests at uh, different pipeline steps. Um, in our benchmark, we varied the size of the job, uh, and the results that are presented here are in terms of the uh, the cost of uh, the data flow prime job as a proportion of the conventional uh, data flow uh, job. And the break-even mark is uh, marked by the dotted line. Uh, so uh, as you can see, at a very small job size, um, we uh, using Prime is initially more expensive as we're not doing enough processing uh, to amortize uh, the overhead of stopping and starting uh, distinct work worker pools. Um, however, as we increase the job size, um, the efficiency gains uh, quickly start to dominate and we end up converging to around 40% uh, uh, cost savings. Um, so 
why did we end up uh, achieving these cost savings? Um, so first of all, um, IO can take uh, a lot of time, especially if you're writing out um, a lot of uh, data. Um, so in our case, when we use uh, write to the write to BigQuery transform, um, we're spending a lot of time waiting for uh, do funds like uh, trigger load uh, jobs and write records to file uh, to move data to and between uh, the temporary and target uh, BigQuery tables. Um, so this is especially true, um, the larger the amount of data you're trying to uh, write out. So uh, secondly, um, our uh, GPU steps are in the pipeline are dependent on CPU bound steps uh, in the pipeline DAG. Uh, this means that while the uh, CPU steps are um, working hard to pre-process uh, data in preparation for inference, uh, the GPU is spending some of that time idling while uh, the data trickles through. Um, by using Dataflow Prime, uh, we ensure that the uh, pre-processing has run to completion uh, by a designated worker pool. And then only when that has completed, do we spin up uh, a new GPU worker pool um, to uh, do the inference. Uh, so this ensures that we can run the uh, GPU uh, dependent steps with higher throughput uh, and with higher resource utilization, uh, which means uh, lower costs overall. Uh, so some recommendations if you want to try out uh, Dataflow Prime. Uh, I would recommend you to benchmark uh, your pipelines um, to measure if you do, uh, if you uh, should expect to see cost savings. Uh, it can be the case that you uh, end up paying more if you're using Prime. And uh, you can use uh, resource labeling on your Dataflow jobs uh, to track uh, costs at the job level. Um, and the second uh, pitfall uh, I'd just like to mention is that sometimes the Dataflow service will do uh, uh, stage uh, fusions uh, and you need to impose a manual uh, fusion break uh, to make sure that, uh, for example, uh, for example, rather than uh, the data flow service executing steps two and three uh, together with the same worker pool, uh, you want to make sure there's, they are executed with uh, distinct uh, worker pools. So uh, it may be the case that you need to add, for example, a reshuffle step in between steps two and four, steps two and three um, to impose a fusion break. Um, yep, so uh, I'd like to move on to the next uh, use case. Uh, so at Trustpilot, we have uh, recently started working on building uh, chat interfaces to our reviews um, that are powered by large language models. Um, so although uh, large language models are very adept at generating uh, realistic text, uh, they're very prone to hallucinations uh, when relying on frozen uh, when relying on knowledge frozen uh, in its model parameters. Um, so one way we can deal with this is by uh, doing retrieval augmentation. Um, in other words, we add uh, relevant context uh, to our prompts to the model. Um, and in our use case, um, this has been enough to get uh, really useful and importantly, uh, correct generations uh, out of the LLM. Uh, and you can see an example of that here. Um, so for retrieval, we uh, commonly depend on vector stores uh, to do embedding uh, similarity lookup. And to provide that data into the vector store, um, it's very natural for us to use beam pipelines uh, to ingest that data in. Um, however, quite often, um, getting a single embedding per a data object is not enough. Uh, so the number of useful embeddings that we can create out of the same data 
is as varied as the number of ML problems applicable to that data. So we would then like to have a retrieval service that is a bit more general and can be useful, useful for many different users and different applications. Um, so for example, while for a chat interface like this, uh, we might be uh, content to retrieve uh, reviews data uh, by embeddings that encode uh, the semantics of that review text. Uh, but for a fraud detection uh, use case, um, quite often the semantics of the text itself is not as relevant as uh, the profile of a user's actions. Uh, for, so for example, a user that has signed up really recently and then started writing a ton of reviews. Um, and uh, in the product recommendation use case, um, relying on semantic similarity of text alone of a review uh, will only lead to very similar uh, products being recommended. So we might want to have an embedding that takes into account uh, the review content together with other user information. Um, so the problem with this is that at the moment it's quite difficult to share uh, GPU resources um, and it makes it difficult to run the kind of workflow uh, that you see on the left here. Um, so what we would ideally like to do is to load uh, several different uh, embedding models uh, into uh, a single GPU device that multiple uh, processes in our Beam pipeline can then access for inference. Um, however, there is a feature uh, forthcoming in Dataflow, uh, which will allow us uh, to achieve uh, this uh, kind of uh, workflow. Um, and this means that as long as our uh, models fit into uh, GPU memory, uh, multiple processes will then be able to run inference uh, concurrently. Uh, this will increase uh, GPU utilization and uh, lower our overall cost of doing large backfills of uh, multi uh, of the sort of multiple embeddings uh, that you see here. Um, I'll just mention that most uh, vector stores um, don't support um, data objects being indexed uh, by multiple um, embeddings. But uh, there are some such as Quadrant uh, that allow this. Um, so I'm just going to move on to the next uh, uh, optimization use case, uh, which is in speeding up uh, linear algebra operations. Um, so linear algebra operations are very common, commonly used in machine learning. Uh, and there's a list of those here. Um, and first of all, first of all, I'd like to show you how easy it is to convert code from uh, their NumPy implementations to uh, JAX. Um, so in this example, we are computing the pairwise uh, Euclidean distance uh, between two uh, between rows and two matrices, uh, and this is implemented with uh, NumPy operations. Uh, to, do, to do that with JAX, we use the drop-in library from JAX um, and we are not really changing anything uh, in the code. Uh, but before we uh, are ready to actually use this and pass uh, data into it, uh, there is an additional step uh, at the bottom here uh, to compile our implementation into a more optimized form that fuses these operations together. Um, so to set all of this up in a Beam uh, pipeline is really simple. Uh, so first of all, we define a pure, a pure function, which uh, will do um, our computation. Um, as it's a pure function, it doesn't depend on any state. Uh, so we set this as a static uh, method. Um, we then define our uh, computation with the uh, JAX NumPy uh, drop-in functions. Um, and in this case, we're computing a radial basis 
kernel function between two matrices. Uh, but the details about that are, aren't too important here. Um, the next step is to compile uh, the function that we've just defined. And the best place to do this is in the init method of our do fun, um, because we only want to do this uh, relatively costly op operation once. Uh, and that's really simple to do. We just apply uh, the JIT function uh, from the JATS library onto our own function. And then finally, we're ready to use the compiled function. Uh, so this compiled function has the same signature as um, the one that we defined. Uh, and in our uh, use case where we have a PCA projection and then we compute a uh, distance metric, uh, we, fi we find a 5 to 10x uh, speed up uh, compared to doing it with sklearn. Uh, so that's the numbers uh, just on the CPU alone. Um, the really great thing about JAX is that it's very trivial uh, to dispatch this computation uh, to run on the GPU, and then that will give you an even greater speed up. Uh, so finally, I'll really quickly touch on our experiences uh, adopting run inference in our ML pipelines. Um, so on the left here, uh, this is all, all of the things that uh, we had to uh, do in our custom implementation, uh, including setting up the handling of uh, the model loading uh, and then uh, dealing with all of the problems that Beam's uh, innate parallelism uh, presents uh, our machine learning uh, use case. Uh, so run inference takes uh, care of uh, all of these things for us. Um, and I used a tool called SEC to actually uh, benchmark uh, the complexity of uh, our code. So this is uh, previously we had an implementation that had um, 112 lines of code with a complexity rating of uh, 14. Uh, in our composite P-transform, which uses uh, run inference at its heart, uh, we've more than halved the lines of code and the complexity measure has gone from 14 to two. Uh, so these are all really crude measurements, um, but there is, I've linked some uh, material if you want to do a bit more reading. Um, so yeah, I think adopting run inference lowers uh, the barrier of entry uh, in our team for uh, contributing to our code base. Uh, and um, yeah, it, it will make machine uh, setting up machine uh, learning inference in beam pipelines uh, much easier. Uh, so this is what I've spoken about today. Um, and I'm happy to take any questions.